Well, hey, good morning again, man. We are in week, f- there we go. Week four of our series, of our series, Full Story, and we've been looking at all things Bible, and it's just been amazing. And so today we're answering the question, why study the Bible? Why should we give you know, attention and, and, and focus? Why should we study the Scriptures? And so, as I said, we've been looking at just how incredible the Bible is, how it, is, it has just survived the test of time. It is the most unique form of literature that has ever existed. It has been the most attacked, <laughs> the most sold, the most translated uh, piece of literature in all of human history. And yet, and yet according to, to, to Barna Research Group, they did a, a survey back in 2018, and they wanted to find out you know, just how, how much Americans, how much in the Western world are people actually reading and engaging with the Bible? And I, th- I think the, the information was pretty interesting. I think we have a, a picture of it here. They found that 52%, this is, the numbers might be a little bit different because this was from uh, 2018, 52% said not at all. How often do you, do you read or engage the Bible? 52% not at all. 8% three to four times a year. 6% once a month. Another 8% said once a week. I think another eight was, was a couple times a week. And only 14% said that they engaged with God's word on a daily basis. Isn't that amazing? I mean, we have this incredible, unique gift from God. There's nothing else like it. And yet so many people are not engaging with it in a consistent way. Well, the question is, is well, then what are we doing, you know, What are we doing instead of that? Found another study, and they found this. And this is just uh, 15 to 23-year-olds, okay? So if you kind of land in that category between 15 and 23, uh, those of you that that are older, don't worry, your numbers are are pretty close as well. They found that on average, um, the average 15 to 23-year-old spent 2,736 hours on screen time last year. 2,736, that that is roughly 53 hours a week. They asked the same age range, and these are church attenders, how much time did you spend last year engaging in spiritual content? So remember, 2,736 hours on screens, only 291 hours engaging in spiritual content. That means that so many of us, so many of us were being discipled by the culture around us. We're being discipled by our culture through social media and and the 24-hour news media and entertainment. Our values, our thoughts, our perspective are kind of just just constantly being washed over by, by wave after wave of culture. And I'll tell you this, even the strongest substance in the world is not immune to that. In fact, look at this picture. There's a, that's a rock out in the ocean and it's the victim of erosion. This strong, uh, sturdy rock. And yet when wave after wave c- continues to crash against it, it causes erosion. And the same things can happen in our lives. To put it another way, we are what we eat. We are what we fill our minds with, what we fill our souls with. And then we wonder why so many people in our world are just inundated with anxiety and depression. So many people are, are just, they find themselves easily frustrated. Things kind of just set you off. Or it doesn't take much to kind of, kind of, to, to use a word that I don't like, to, to, to trigger you. <laughs> so many are, are dissatisfied or discontent in their lives. People who love God, People who genuinely love God, but you find yourself spiritually weak, sluggish, lacking passion, just timid in our faith. And I'm not gonna ask for a, a show of hands. But I think far too many of us, we, we have this next verse here in reverse. Look, this is, this is Romans 12, 2. It says, do not be conformed, but instead, so many of us are conforming to the pattern of our world rather than being transformed by the renewing of our mind through the word of God. We were just inundated wave after wave of this culture that we live in, washes over our minds and it takes effect on on how we view the world around us. So what's the alternative? 
Let's look at what the Lord says to Joshua. Joshua chapter 1. We have this in your, your handouts. Joshua chapter 1, verse 8. The Lord says this. It says, Keep this book of the law always on your lips. Meditate on it day and night so that you may be careful to do everything that's written in it. Now, now here, you can, Joshua is such an interesting character in Scripture. I mean, are there, are there any people that, that enjoy history? Any history buffs in the room? A few people? Joshua was kind of like Harry Truman. Okay, if you know who Harry Truman was, Harry Truman was vice president to the four-term uh, Franklin Delano Roosevelt, four-term president, led the United States out of the Great Depression, led through World War II, and then all of a sudden in the middle of the night, Harry Truman gets the phone call, or the, the, the telegram actually, guess what, uh, Roosevelt is dead, you're now the man. It's up to you, it's on your shoulders to, to lead us out of this. That's what happened to Joshua. Moses who had been the leader for, for over 40 years, led the children of Israel out of Egypt. Miracles were performed. Parting of the Red Sea, through the wilderness. Now it's all on Joshua's shoulders. You're the man now. Oh, and by the way, the land that you're getting ready to go into, it's full of enemies. It's full of enemies. Hittites and uh, Amorites and Jebusites and Parasites. Well, that's okay. Maybe. I don't know. The land you're getting ready to, it's, it's full of landmines. But Joshua, I want you to know, I've left you a map. I've left you a map that will show you the way out. The, 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 what you're getting ready to walk into, it's full of landmines. But it goes on to say, if you follow the map, if you meditate on my law, it says then you'll be prosperous and successful. Amen. You'll be prosperous and successful. It's not saying you're going to have the, the good life, but it is saying you're going to have a good life. Not easy, but good. But you need to know the, the, the way ahead of you is full of landmines. And let's be honest, the world that we live in, it, it's full of landmines. Just trying to navigate our, our modern world and everything that's happening in culture and everything that's happening in our relationships and the, and the pull of, of money and identity and, and where do we find ourselves that there are so many landmines. Let me ask you though, you know, let's say that you were going to be um, you know, walking through a, 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 a field of landmines, but, but you were given a map that, that shows the location of the, man, of the landmines. How, how would you respond? Would you kind of just glance at it like, eh, take a little look. I'm just going to, you know, maybe I'll look at it later tonight if I have time. You know, right now I got to just, I got to get through this landmine field. So I'll, I don't really have time to look at this map. We would give it attention. We'd meditate on it. We'd study it. See, as believers, we're called to do more than just read the Bible. We're, we're called, as, as a follower of Jesus, we're called to do more than just read the Bible. Now, now some of you are like, well, that is good news because whew, I don't like to read. <laughs> I haven't, haven't picked up a book since high school. I don't plan on it. <clears throat> and if that's you, that's okay. Because let me say this, you may not like to read, but you know how to study. Every person in this room, I guarantee it, that, that there is something that you have studied. There's something that you're interested in that, that grabs a hold of your heart or your mind and you have intently spent time and energy and focus on figuring it out. There are so many people. There are, there are business people that have not picked up a book in years. They, they haven't read a book since high school and yet they know how to read the markets. They understand it. <clears throat> they know how it operates and, and what it's going to do. They've studied business. They've studied the markets. They, they figured it out. My wife, she's a teacher and she knows how to read students. It, it's incredible. I've seen her do it. She knows how, how to, to, to understand what they're feeling and what's important to them and how to connect with them. And she helps them to take ownership of their education. She reads students. It's amazing. Maybe you're in the trades. Maybe you're a plumber or an electrician, or a mechanic. You know, it's amazing. A mechanic, a mechanic knows the inner workings of an engine. You just, you have it figured out. You know the inner workings of an engine, how they operate, how they interact with different additives. I've seen some of you guys, you guys are crazy in a good way, okay? Because I can't do this, but like, like you can like be around a vehicle and you like, you can smell something from the engine and you can like diagnose an engine by its smell, okay? Or you can hear it revving, like, oh, there's something wrong with that, that cylinder. 
You know, it is amazing. Why? Because they've studied mechanics. They've studied it. Not, it's not just a head knowledge, but it's a hands-on proficiency. You know it. You know it inside and out. You, you understand how it operates. Each and every one of us has something like that in our lives. And when I talk about studying the Bible, that's what I'm talking about. It is so much more than just reading. Whether you enjoy reading or not, you can, you can learn how to study. Because remember, we said this at the beginning, books are common. Books are common, but the Bible is so much more than just a book. A, a book can, can inform us. The Bible can transform us. I mean, you, you, can, you can pick up a book on karate or karate, as some would say, uh, and you might learn about karate if you pick up a book and read about it. But it, what happens when you meet with a karate instructor? Then you walk away knowing karate. I want to suggest when we open God's word, when we engage with God's word, that is what's happening. We're meeting with the author and we are being equipped to become something more. Okay, so let's look at that. Let's, let's take a few minutes. I just want to take a few minutes and I want to look at the uses of the Bible. If we want to be, become um, proficient in it, how do we use the Bible? What is it for? So if you're taking notes, this is your notes. Number one, the Bible is a light for direction. The Bible is a light for direction. Psalms 119, verse 105 says, and you can turn there if you'd like, Psalms 119, verse 105 says, your word is a lamp for my feet and a light for my path. Your word, the Bible, it's a lamp for my feet, it's a light for my path. Anybody enjoy going camping? Has anybody, has anybody gone camping? A few of you have gone camping. I remember going camping as a kid, and there were times when I'd be in the tent, you know, and I'd have to get up in the middle of the night to go to the bathroom, but I didn't want to wake anybody up, but I couldn't find my flashlight. So you're like, you know, jostling around with the zipper trying to get the thing open. And like, you're like walking down the trail in the dark, you know, and like, sure enough, you're going to find every hole, every tree branch, every root sticking out of the ground. And of course, when you can't see, you know, how do you walk? You know, like, okay, walking that, then you hear like a strange noise, like, whoo -hoo! What was that? Right? You kind of like pause. And then you're like, you don't need to go to the bathroom anymore. Okay? It's amazing. Light. Light makes life so much easier. It, it makes it so much easier and so much less scary. And God says, my word, my word is a light for this world. I want to turn on the light. I want to give you clarity and direction so you can know where to go and how to respond to the challenges that you're seeing in this world. But there's more, it's more than that. It's more than just a list of, of rules. See, some people think of the Bible and think it's just, just a list of rules, you know, a bunch of do's and don'ts and you have to follow. But, but listen to the verse before this. Psalms 119, verse 104. It says, I gain understanding from your precepts. Therefore, I hate every wrong path. It says, it says it's, it's not a rule book, but, but as I read God's word, I, I'm gaining understanding. Like the, that light bulb is coming on. There's clarity. And I realize, okay, wow. It's not saying don't do this and don't do that. But as I read his word, I gain understanding. And I realize that path isn't going to take me where I want to go. And this path is not going to be in the direction God wants for my life. And this path is going to hurt my marriage. I gain understanding. And the result is, is every wrong path. I hate it. I hate it because I realize where it's going. The Bible gives us blueprints for our life. It says if you kind of, if you study them, if you pay attention and you allow it to direct you, you're going to build something that, that's safe and sound and something that'll last the test of time that you can entrust your family with. You're building something you can trust your family with, that you can entrust what you value most. The Bible is a lamp or a light for direction. Number two, it's a sword for protection. The Bible is a sword for our protection. You can jump back a couple verses to, to verse 9 of Psalms 119, verse 9. It says this, though, in Ephesians 6. It says, take up the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. Take up the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. It's saying that the Bible acts like a sword. It's a weapon. It's a weapon for our defense and our protection. Do you remember every time when Jesus was sent into the wilderness right before he began his ministry? 
<clears throat> and he was tempted. The enemy tried to attack him. What was Jesus' weapon of choice? The scriptures. Yeah, over and over again, he said, it is written. It is written. One time the devil says, hey, Jesus, you've been out here for 40 days and you haven't ate anything. You gotta be real hungry, Jesus. You must be hungry. You know, if you really are the son of God, why don't you turn these stones into bread? Now, now let me ask you, was Jesus being hungry? Was that a, was that a bad desire? Was that, a, was that an evil desire? No, it was a good, natural desire. But that is what the enemy does to us. He takes good desires, natural desires, and he tries to elevate them above their rightful place and worship them. He tries to take a good thing and turn it into a God thing. And he tries to, across the board, so many good things in our lives, our career, our family, our finances. He can take any of these things and try, try to put it up here and make this the goal. And, and I, we try to worship it. And it takes a good thing and turns it into a, God's, a God thing. See, but God's word protects us. Protects us from, from, from sweet sounding lies, especially when we're at weak moments. That's why I love what the psalmist says. Psalms 119 verse nine. How can a young person stay in the path of purity? And you know, it says it's for a young person, but you know what? I think this can apply to each and every one of us. How do we stay on the right path? How do we, how do we make sure that we're gonna end up in the direction we, we want, that, that, that God wants for our lives? By keeping your word. Now the translation says, by living according to your word. I seek you with all my heart. Do not let me stray from your commands. Man, if, if you're a follower of Jesus, if that isn't your heart, because I think we all recognize that there is a tendency to stray. <clears throat> There's a tendency to, to step off the path. We see something that looks, looks better, something that we think might, might get us where we want to be quicker. And we have a tendency to stray. So please, don't, don't let me do that. Don't let me stray for your commandments. Verse 11, I have hidden your word in my heart that I might not sin against you. I've hidden your word. Hiding God's word, it, it is a weapon. We, we put truth into our heart ahead of time, be, long before the lie comes. Long before that temptation comes, we have God's truth hidden in our heart so that when the temptation comes, we can hate every wrong path. Amen. The word of God, it, it is, it's a, a light for our direction. It is a, a, a weapon for our protection. And number three, the Bible is a mirror for our reflection. It's a mirror for our reflection. And, and we may not like this one, and correction. It's, it's for reflection and correction. James chapter one says this. It says, do not merely listen to the word and so deceive yourselves, but do what it says. Anyone who listens to the word but does not do what it says is like someone who looks at his face in the mirror and then after looking at himself goes away and immediately forgets what he looks like. But whoever looks intently into the perfect law that gives freedom and continues in it, it's key, and continues in it and does not forget what they have heard, but doing it, they will be blessed in what they do. So, so let me ask you then, what's the purpose of a mirror? What's the purpose of a mirror? A mirror simply shows us reality. <laughs> it, just, it just shows us reality. It shows us what's there, you know, uh, good or bad. And so it shows us what we actually look like. So wh why do we use a mirror? Maybe before you, before you leave the house, you kind of run into the bathroom, you check real quick to make sure that, you know, you had some spinach pizza at lunch. You want to make sure that there's none of that spinach kind of stuck around. You know, you check your teeth, make sure that your, your makeup isn't smeared. You didn't miss a spot shaving. What we're doing is we're looking at ourselves, we're, we're, we're asking the question, do I want to go out into the world like this or is there something that needs to be addressed first? Amen. And we get that. We recognize that in, in our everyday lives. We want to go out with a big old smudge of something on our face. It's saying it's the same thing spiritually. And then maybe you've, you've had this happen, you get a haircut and you go get your haircut and what do they do? They cut your hair and you're in front of this big mirror, but before you leave, they have the person and then we have a picture of it. There you go. That's a, that's a real fancy haircut there. So that's, I couldn't afford that haircut. But anyhow, they hold up a mirror in the back so you can, they hold up a mirror behind you so you can see the places that, that are hard for us to naturally see. Can I suggest that's what connect groups are? That's why we get in, in connect groups because we have brothers and sisters in Christ. They hold up the mirror of God's word to our lives and help us to see those places that maybe we couldn't see so well ourselves. It's a mirror for our, for our reflection. Although the issue now is, 
is, is a lot of us, you know, we don't use a traditional mirror anymore. Some of us use this as a mirror, don't we? Have you ever done this? Where it's like, you think maybe you got something in your teeth and you're getting ready to see somebody so you can just kind of turn on the camera, you know, just check on your phone, right? You know, you know you've done it, okay? You know, right? And you're crying, what, what? And nothing wrong with that. But the problem is, is this. The problem is, is, is there's filters on our phone. I've seen people do this with social media. Whereas it, now, if I don't like what I see in the mirror, instead of cr- saying, God, I need your help, I need you to, to work inside me and change me from the inside out, Lord, help us to address this thing. This thing I see in the mirror, I don't like it. I don't like how I look. Now what we can do is we have filters. And we say, you know what? I don't like what I see. I'm not going to ask God to change me. I'm just going to change the mirror. I'm just going to change the mirror. Well, you know, does the Bible really say that? Maybe it doesn't really mean that. I'll find this person on YouTube and they'll say what I want to hear. And they'll make me feel good. They'll say, hey, that stain that's on your face, and you go to Connect Group or you go to your best friend and say, you've got a stain on your face. Don't judge me. Yeah, but you've got a big like spaghetti stain on your face. Don't judge me. You go on YouTube and they'll tell you, guess what? That's not a stain, that's a birthmark. And it's perfectly fine. God made you that way. Okay? Hey, you don't have to change. That's a beautiful birthmark. And we will go through our life calling stains birthmarks. It's a dangerous place to be. It's a dangerous place to be. So, God's word is true. We talked about that last time. We, we can trust his word, even at times when we don't understand, or we even, even when we disagree with it, we can still trust God's word, that it has authority in our lives. So the question is this, what do we do when our reflection doesn't match what's in the mirror? How do we respond? If we're going to follow Jesus, what, what do we do when, when, when the reflection doesn't match what's in the mirror and something has to change? What do we do? I love what Ephesians says. Ephesians 5 says this, even as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for it, that he might sanctify and cleanse it with the washing of water by the word. That's why we're doing these soap journals, okay? We're, we're taking God's word and we are gonna use it to, to wash our minds. We go out in the world where we're, we're inundated with so many different thoughts and values on life and finances and career and marriage. I'm like, hey, if it's not working for you, you can just kind of bounce out, you know? The grass is greener over here. We hear messages like that all the time. You deserve to be happy. You deserve whatever it is. We're going to take the soap and the water of God's word. And we're going to wash our minds. That's why for the month of May, I want to encourage you, pick up one of these. And we have the, the kids plan here. They're available uh, in the lobby at the information desk. You can also find an online copy on our website at vantagepointchurch.net. We're going to be going through the book of Mark together as a church. And we're going to be sharing our insights and we're going to be encouraging one another and we're going to allow God's word to wash over our mind. I love it. It goes on to say that he might, by the water of the word, that he might present it to himself a glorious church, not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing. You hear that? There's not going to be any wrinkles in heaven. Right there in the Bible. Because some of y'all, you want to get saved today just for that alone. Okay? It's better than Botox. Or any such thing but it should be holy and without blemish. So, so, so let me ask you, in the natural, what do you do, you know, if you've got a pan that's got stuck on food on it? You know what I'm saying? Food is kind of all just crusted on it. If you're, if you're like me, when I was a kid, we just take it and hide it in the oven and hope mom doesn't find it. <laughs> Anybody know? That just makes it worse. Okay, when it's real stuck on there like that, what do you do? Here's what you do. When it won't come off, you let it soak in the water until what doesn't belong starts to loosen and come off. That's what we do in the natural. We take, when when there's something stuck on there, you can't get it off, you put it in the water and you let it soak until what doesn't belong there starts to loosen up and come off. We do the same thing. We allow the water of God's word to wash over us. We soak in his presence until, until my will starts to soften up. I mean, there are times where, where we can come to God's word and we're like, this is what I want to do. I want to pursue this thing. Okay, God, I, I know like, like, I know in this situation I'm right and my wife is wrong. Okay? And so, so I just, I'm going to find a verse there somewhere in the Bible that says that because I know it's got to be there somewhere, right? Like, but I come into God's presence 
and I stay there and I allow the, the water of his word to wash over my mind and, and I spend time until my will starts to, starts to loosen up. You know, it's amazing, even, even Jesus had to do this. If you remember in the Garden of Gethsemane, there he's praying and, and God's will for his life, God says, says you, you're gonna go to the cross and Jesus says, let this cup pass from me. He says, I, I don't wanna do this, this sounds painful. This is not the direction I wanna go. I don't wanna move forward, but not my will. Your will be done. Amen. Three times Jesus had to soak in God's presence until God, God uh, adjusted the, 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 that natural part. He was all God, but all man. He had real will and emotions and feelings. And there was a part of him that said, I, this, I don't want to do this. But God's word worked in his life. See, God's word is a light for direction, a sword for protection, a mirror for reflection. And then finally, it's food for nourishment and satisfaction. Amen. The Bible is food. Why, why should we study the Bible? Why should we, why should we become um, uh, consistent and, and, and proficient in knowing how to use it? And because it, it does all these things in our lives. It's food for nutrition. Remember what Jesus said when he was being tempted by Satan. He said, man shall not live by bread alone. Right? That's the only thing that nourishes me and sustains me. Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that comes from the mouth of of God. The Word of God nourishes us. It feeds us so that we're not spiritually hangry. Some of y'all have been hangry. Some of you are hangry right now. Like, I can tell you're like elbowing people and you're digging and then trying to find like a cracker or something. I apologize. We'll wrap it up soon. Okay, it's not even noon. Okay, just chill. You get hangry. Have you ever been hangry? Some people, you're spiritually hangry and it works out the same way. We don't have, we don't have full focus. And maybe you kind of feel spiritually weak. And you find yourself reaching for the wrong things. You know, when you're super hungry, you, you might be on a, on a, you know, you want to be healthy. You're going you're gonna to eat, you know, celery sticks with peanut butter. Good for you. Okay? A kale salad. That sounds delicious, said no one ever. But, but you would do that. But when you get hangry, you just kind of reach for whatever's nearest. And sometimes we make bad choices. We do the same thing in our spiritual lives when we get spiritually hangry. But the Word of God does more than just feed us. I love this. We'll throw this verse on the screen. Psalms 103, verse 5. This is, this is so good. This is what, what our God does. He doesn't, just, he doesn't just take care of a need. It says this, who satisfies your desires with good things so that your, new, your youth is renewed like the eagles. Amen. It says it's more than just nourishment. God wants to do more than just provide nourishment. You have to eat to stay alive. We all know that. Like, like you have to eat if you want to live. God's word it's meant to satisfy our greatest desires with what's good. He wants, to, he wants to satisfy your deepest desires with what is actually good. And think about it. So many problems in our lives, if we're, if we're honest, so many of our problems in, our, in life, they boil down to simply this. It's us trying to, to get our desires met apart from God. We all have desires and appetites. We all have, have things in our lives and they're not bad things. Some of them are very natural desires. A desire to want to be known and cared for and loved. And, and sometimes we feel like if I'm not finding it in my marriage, I might try to find it online or find it with some other person. That is a natural desire. But, but what happens is we try to, 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 to meet that desire apart from God. He wants to satisfy, not just, not just stave off or substitute. Our good God, he wants to satisfy the deepest desires of your life with what is actually good. Amen. Research was done on Bible engagement. Did another survey, they're big on surveys. They just wanted to find out how much Americans, how much are Americans reading their Bibles? How are they engaging? And as they were doing this study, they found some, some really interesting information I wanna share it with you. They, they surveyed around 40,000 people and uh, what they found is people who read their Bible, you know, once or twice a week, they, they, they didn't get much of a, it didn't, didn't register much in their life. But then they looked at people who read their Bible three times a week and then four times a week. And, and for whatever reason, people who, who engaged with the scriptures four times or more a week, they found this, feelings of loneliness dropped by 30%. <clears throat> Anger issues decreased by 32%. Bitterness in relationships went down by 40%. Amazing. Alcoholism decreased 
by 57%. Looking at pornography decreased by 61%. And then a positive number, sharing your faith actually increased by 200%. Just by engaging consistently with God's word. He wants to satisfy, not substitute or stave off. He actually wants to satisfy. I love what the apostle Paul says in Acts 20, verse 32. He says, now I commit you to God and... See, a lot of us have done that. We've done that first step, haven't we? We've committed ourselves to God. We we raised our hand in in a real moment uh, of sincerity. We said, God, I I give you my life. I I don't want to do things my own way anymore. I need you. I surrender. We commit our lives to God. But he goes on. He says, I commit you to God and to the word of his grace. It's a commitment to God and it's his word that does something. His word of grace, which can build you up and give you an inheritance amongst all those who are sanctified. God's word wants, wants to build you up. His word is like growth protein. Okay, if anybody who lifts weight, I don't, you can tell. But he wants to build you up so that, that he produces something in you. It, it is incredible. Amen. It gives you an, an inheritance, meaning something that lasts talking about spiritual gains. It's more than just a good feeling, but it's something that's gonna, gonna keep producing results in your life. That's what God wants his word to do. I'm gonna invite the worship team to come back at this time. Don't put it on the screen yet. I have one more verse, but I, I, wanna, I wanna do something here first because this is kind of a famous scripture verse. Then you're all very intelligent and all very well-read people. And so I know that once I start uh, quoting this verse, you're gonna be able to finish it. You probably know this verse, okay? So let's see. It says, and you shall know the truth, and the truth shall set you free. That's awesome. Y'all did a great job. Give yourself a nice, nice hand. Yeah, good job. There you go. Right? You shall be proud of yourself. And you know, that is a famous scripture verse. And, and, and it's well quoted. There are a lot of people that know this verse. I mean, politicians quote this verse. It's in movies. It's everywhere. But yet, you may not be aware, many people are not aware, that when you quote that verse, you're actually quoting an incomplete sentence by Jesus. Everyone wants to quote the second part of the verse. Jesus had so much more to say. Let's look at it at the full context. John 8, verse 31. Jesus said, if you continue in my word, if you continue in my word, you really are my disciples. And then, (laughs) and then, if you continue in my word, you're my disciples. And then you'll know the truth and the truth will set you free. Let me ask us, and this is just in your own heart, do, do we really want freedom? Yes. Do, we, do we really want freedom? Do, do we really want satisfaction? Amen. Do we want to be satisfied? Then we have to continue in his word, study it, use it, grab a hold of that light and that sword and that meal and that mirror and allow God to teach us how to use it in our everyday lives, to become proficient and to study it like a mechanic. <laughs> so that you know it inside and out and you can use it. So when the attacks of the enemy come or when there's an opportunity to be used by the Lord, we are prepared and equipped and ready. God's word doesn't just inform us, it transforms us. And that's what we want for each and every one of us. That's why we we put these together for, for you as an adult and for your kids and grandkids because we know the power of getting into God's word, allowing it to, to wash through us to produce things in our lives that only his word can do. So I want to encourage you. Got a couple days left before the beginning of May. Pick one of these up. Allow God to be in work. And we're going to do this as a church family together. If you miss a day, don't worry about it. Just jump back in on the next day. You can catch up later. It's not about, it's just about doing this together and allowing God's word to work in our lives. We want that for you. We want us to be transformed by God's word. Let's pray. Father God, we just thank you so much that you love us, that you give us this incredible gift called the Bible. It it is so much more than just a book. It transforms our lives as we engage with it. So Father, would you help us to do that? Would you help us to take your word in our lives and allow it to transform us? That we would give it the, the place and the priority that it deserves. As we're praying this morning, I just have a a simple question for you when it comes to the the Word of God. What's missing? What what do you need? For some, you need direction. 
There, there's some decisions in your life you're going to be facing right now, and you feel like you're stumbling around in the dark. Would you turn on the light of God's word? Others, you feel like you keep falling in the same place. You keep getting the bumps and bruises in the same places. Like, why do I keep making the same decisions? You need the protection of God's word. You need to suit up before you step out into a dangerous world. Allow God's word to protect you. You're here and you want real change. You want your life to look different next month than it did last month. Look intently in God's word and let, let him tell you who you are. And it's not just negative things. It's not like when you look in the mirror of God's word, it's gonna say, oh, oh, you messed up here and you're not meeting the standard there. He wants to let you know you are loved. You are chosen. You're the head, not the tail. Amen. I've got provision for you. I've got wisdom for you. There is so much that God wants you to see in his word. He sees you differently than you see yourself. Look intently into his word. Lasting satisfaction, regardless of what's happening around you the highs and the lows. We keep chasing feelings, keep chasing a number on a scale or likes on a screen or numbers in a bank account. We keep chasing all these things and we never quite achieve it. Real and lasting satisfaction. God wants you to experience that. Say, Lord, with your help, I'm gonna engage your word. I'm gonna make it a priority. I'm gonna study it like a mechanic with an engine. I wanna know your word. But maybe you're here today and you say, well, you know, that, that sounds like a tall order <laughs> from, from just one book. I mean, how is it possible I can get all those things from just reading it, a book? Well, here's what you need to realize. When you surrender your life to Jesus, you're not just reading a book, you're meeting with the author. You're meeting with the author and he wants to give you all those things. He wants to provide all those things we discussed in your life. So this morning, I, I can't leave without giving you an opportunity. If any of those things I said kind of kind of hit home in your heart, you say, I want things to be different. I'm tired of making the, the, the same mistakes and finding myself in the same place. I want lasting satisfaction. Not, not the good life, but a good life that you provide for me. And you're ready to surrender your life to Jesus. You're ready to say, Lord, I, I, I can't do this on my own anymore. I'm tired of trying. I want to give my life to you. I want you to, to lead and guide my life. If that's you with everyone's eyes closed, I'm just gonna invite you to, to raise your hand so I know I'm praying for. I'm not gonna call you to the front. I just wanna know who I'm praying for. God bless you. Anybody else is gonna give you a moment. Say, I wanna surrender my life to Jesus. God bless you. I wanna make him my Lord and Savior. Well, here's what we're gonna do. This is not a magic formula. Uh, even if you didn't raise your hand, if this is the intention of your heart, you're inviting God to be in working in your life. And at Vantage Point, no one prays alone. So I'm gonna invite the entire congregation. Would you pray this prayer along with me? Make it your own. Let's pray together. Father God, I give you my life. I'm sorry for going my own way, for choices that have hurt me and choices that have hurt you. Thank you for sending Jesus to die for my sins, to give me freedom, hope, and new life. I receive you now in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. I'm going to invite you to stand to your feet if you're able to at this time. Man, for those of you that said that prayer, especially for the first time, we are so excited for you. You're beginning a brand new relationship with Jesus. And we have a little booklet called Now What? It's available at our uh, information desk out in the lobby along with the Bible. I want to encourage you to pick that up free of charge. Even if you didn't raise your hand, it's our gift to you today. We want to help you connect with the Lord. We're going to close with a song of worship. And we'll have members of our prayer team here in the front. If you'd like prayer for anything at all, uh, you can just come forward and, and uh, they'll pray for you. Let's take these next few moments and connect with the Lord. Allow him to, to solidify everything he's done in our lives over these last few moments together. Let's worship the Lord together.